run that program for the young ones. Otherwise, you stay uh, for the sermon. So uh, that's the choice. We're starting today a series called Divine Intimacy, the shaping of a friendship with God. What does that feel like and look like uh, for each one of us? The, uh, just by way of um, uh, people, and uh, today was to be a dedication for my grandchildren, uh, uh, Noah and Emma, but Emma ended up in hospital for four days with grommets and has just come back out of hospital, and uh, so that'll be put forward to next week. And also for some who are aware and those who aren't, Anne Brown, uh, who's been part of our congregation for a very long time, is in ICU and uh, just struggling with lung issues. They are life-threatening. And uh, we're just going to take a moment just to pray as a church for Anne and uh, for those others that we know who have got major health concerns. Would you bow with me in prayer? <coughs> Father, we've just sung a very beautiful song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus all our griefs to bear and one that we can take our prayers. And so today, right now, as your family, as your church, Lord, we just lift up uh, these ones that we know have uh, been through suffering, those that are still facing health challenges, and particularly today, we just lift up Anne. Uh, the doctors have said this is uh, very life threatening and uh, so father we just again commend her into your loving arms lord jesus would you extend your hand of healing right now and uh, father would you take the prayers of your people and would you uh, in mercy just minister to her we ask your blessing on rod and the family as they're uh, watching the events unfold father would you comfort them and fill them with your hope and uh, Lord, we uh, just commit others that we know have got health challenges. And Father, would they sense your presence right now in all of your support? We ask as your people. Amen. Amen. You and I were created for friendship. And what surprises me more than anything else uh, is that God says, I want to be your friend. I don't know if you've imagined what that actually feels like. Isaiah writes what God actually feels. God says, Has not my hand made all these things so that they came into being? And these are the ones I look on with favour. Those who are humble and contrite and those who tremble at my word. So our friend says, let's read his word. And let's tremble together. Let's sense the one who wants to speak to us right now. We're going to be reading over the next four weeks from the life of Abraham. And we're going to start by reading from Genesis 11:31 through to 12, 9. So if you've got a Bible or an iPad or an iPhone or version, uh, join us. And over the next uh, four weeks, there'll be plenty of opportunities to turn some pages together. Genesis 11 Verse 31, Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldees to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. The Lord said, uh, the Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you'll be a blessing. And I'll bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. 
and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram travelled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moriah at Shechem. And at that time the Canaanites were in the land, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued towards the Negev. Friendship with God. One of the most remarkable stories in human history is the life of Abraham, who God says is my friend. God called Abraham not a servant, not a prophet, not a worshipper, but a friend forever. Oswald Chambers makes this point in his devotional. He said the most important aspect in Christianity is not the work we do, but the relationship we maintain with God and the surrounding influence and qualities produced by that relationship. That's all God asks us to give our attention to. And it is the one thing that is continually under attack. James Denny, the Scottish scholar, said, whenever the New Testament writer wished to make a point about religion, he said, look at Abraham. And so over the next four weeks, I want us to look at the life of Abraham and what it can teach us about our friend God and about the nature of our friendship with God. He learned about his friend and he learned to be a friend himself. The life of Abraham is an exploration of our friend. We're introduced to the leading Lord. Where he leads, I'll follow. Next week, El Elyon and El Shaddai experience. What it is to leave the lot with God. And then uh, we're going to look at 18 through 21, the incarnate friend, where Abraham says to this man who comes to his tent, don't pass me by. And then lastly, the father's heart about ultimate requests and ultimate responses that God asks. The more we know of God, the more he reveals himself and the more he invites us to respond to who he is. And so today I want us to just stop for a moment and to think about the passage that we've just read together, about this Lord who leads. The word is Yahweh. In most Bibles it'll be in capitals because it is what they call the four letters or the tetragrammaton. It's unknown in origin. It's not borrowed from any other religion. It appears in human history. God says, this is my name. I want you to know my name and I want you to know who I am, Abram. Will you come on a journey and let me lead you from a place that's very familiar to a place that's unfamiliar, to the place where I can work on that friendship and where we can make a difference to the planet. It was in 1974 that I started to read a book as a teenager called The Life of Abraham by F. B. Meyer. And God was starting to get my attention. I'd started engineering at the University of WA. I'd deferred and spent the rest of the year in a, a chemical laboratory. But in 1974, through this man's life, I felt the challenge to follow. There's just a phrase in the New Testament about Abraham that by faith Abraham went out when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance. Abraham obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. So in 1975, we packed up came from the other side of the world, Perth, to the promised land of uh, Brisbane. And in 1975, I commenced study at Kenmore Christian College. 
Uh, I didn't know what, what that meant, whether I'd be a missionary, a minister, or I'd go back and be a local church member. It didn't worry me where God was leading, provided God was the one who led. I was being drawn not to a destination, but to a divine encounter with a God who wanted to be very personal. But then in 1979, I felt a need uh, to go and be involved in ministry. I was 22 at the time. And that's a picture of my induction. Frank Ewers, the Bible College principal. You can guess which one I am. I'm in the middle by for those who are trying to work it out. Uh, that suit is still available for sale. Uh, so look, just feel free to approach me uh, and uh, I'll see if I can find it somewhere. But it was uh, the start of a journey and uh, last week I had the opportunity of after 44 years to go back and to speak at the 100th anniversary at Toowoomba North where I commenced ministry in 1979. Ten of the previous ministers were in the audience. And uh, if I wasn't feeling nervous uh, with the very large crowd that was there, uh, ten of the previous ministers critiquing the young minister uh, did uh, create a little sense of nervousness. Divine friendship, Abraham. Notice what it says on four occasions in the scriptures. For I have known him as my own in Genesis 18. A little bit later we'll, we'll explore that. For I've chosen, acknowledged, I'm aware of him. I know him. I want to know him. And I want him to know me, says God. In Isaiah, we read these words, You are my servant, Israel, Jacob, whom I have chosen, offspring of Abraham, what? My friend. It's a pretty big deal when God says, I want you to look at this man because he's a friend. He's my friend. And then in Second Chronicles 20 and 7, we read these words that Abraham, your friend forever, that's a bestie. That's a forever friend. And then in the New Testament we read these words, Abraham was called the friend of God. But you know what? He didn't start as a friend. He started as a stranger. He was a, a young man or an older man now living in Ur where the Tigris and Euphrates, it, it was back then a very prosperous region. It was the center of learning, of culture, of wealth, extraordinary affluence compared to any of the other Sumerian towns. There was a huge, and still remains, this huge ziggurat where people would go and worship the stars. It was a town dedicated to the worship of the moon god, and the names that we have around Abram and his family members have all connections to the moon god. It was an extraordinary place. Immense treasures have been excavated from this town. A 11-string harp was excavated. Uh, you get to, if you Google it, to look at some of the other things that were found there. It was a stratified town of farmers and doctors and scribes and priests of thousands of cuneiform texts that have been recovered from temples palaces and homes, contracts, inventories, court documents. It was a complex, affluent centre of the universe. And in the midst of this excavation, you'll find what they call Abram's house. He didn't start in a tent. He started in a home with flushing toilets. The Jews have this legend that Abram was sitting there looking at the stars and said, I will worship the stars. But then the stars set. And then he looked further into the constellations and said, I'll worship the constellations, but they too set. And then he saw the moon rising and said, I will worship the moon. But the moon season was over. And then he saw the sun coming every day out of a chamber like a bridegroom rejoicing as a strong man to run the race. But the day was spent and the sun 
sunk into the western horizon. Stars, constellations, moon and sun. Abram said, these are all unworthy of my worship. They've all set and they've all disappeared. Then he said, I will worship the God who abides forever. And it's this God that God takes the initiative. The family members of Abram were all named after moon gods. In fact, Joshua says, long ago your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the river Euphrates and worshipped other gods. But I took your father, Abram, from beyond the Euphrates and led him. We read these words that there was a clear call. So my question is, where did that call come? And why do we have these apparent contradictions? Do you notice it? Terah took his son and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldees to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. He left in his 60s and he settled halfway. I am the Lord God who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land and for you to take possession. The glory of God appeared to our father Abram while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. I don't know if you can see what's happening in those texts, but he starts in Ur. God puts his impulse into his heart to leave so they pack up their family, but they only get halfway. And they settle down. And the Bible will say very soon that he's now a decade older. He's now 75. His father has died. And now he has permission to keep going in that journey. You see, God has to get you to the right place so he can work on you. And for some of us, we stop halfway in the process. And so our passage says to us, don't stop, don't stagnate, don't settle halfway. Delayed obedience is better than no obedience. And Abram is pulled out of that stagnation and he's moved on. The passage says to us, don't settle for anything less than total obedience. Now is always better than never. And now the voice of God is coming back to Abram. He's being invited to move on, to keep going, to not stop, to not stagnate. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you, have shown you. I don't know about you, but where are you in this journey of faith? Where are you in this friendship with God? God says, keep going. Don't live in yesterday's testimony of how good God was back then. Why not enjoy him right now? God alone can set the direction of one's life. And when those moments come, those crucial moments, when the God of the universe gets your attention, don't squander that moment. Jesus said, the gatekeeper opens the gate, the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. And when he's brought out all of his own, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Let me ask you, do you know the voice of God? That's all God asks of you. This is what the Christian journey is about. It's about a relationship with God. Jesus said, I want you to know me. I want you to know my voice. I want you to be led by the Lord. But God can bring you through missed opportunities and prepare you for the next assignment. Abram, you've stopped in Haran but I want to remind you of that call that I gave you years ago and I want you to keep going. I think Abraham could have said, well, God, I've missed the moment. You know how old I am now? I'm 75. Too old. You know, sometimes we say I'm too young. 
Sometimes we say, I'm too old. I've used both of those excuses. But I've learned over a lifetime that it's important to not miss the moment when the God of the universe is speaking and getting your attention. He wants you to keep going. Now is better than never. Delayed obedience is better than no obedience. Will you keep going in that journey and do the first thing first? You can't take the second step until you take the first step. Have you ever noticed that? You've got to get one leg going before the other leg. You've got to take that first step before you can take a second step. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him. He's getting with the program. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot and noticed this, all the possessions that he had accumulated and all the people he had acquired in Haran. We're going to read very soon that he had 318 personal bodyguards, men trained for warfare and security in his own household. So if you've got 318 bodyguards... How many spouses and kids have you got? How many pastoralists have you got to look after your herds and assets? This is a group of over a thousand people on the move. God is saying, I want you to do the first thing. So my question to you is, do you need to go back to that place where God told you what he wanted to do and do the first thing? See, I think God speaks to every one of us in the room, but it's whether we want to respond to that voice, to be willing to do what you've been told to do by the Spirit of God. Because I want to say God has your name and your number. He knows your life purpose, and he wants you to go out and claim that spiritual territory, that assignment, that activity that he's calling you to do. You know, when I was a teenager, I loved the Word of God. I devoured as a teenager the Word of God. And I loved people. And those two seemed to be a very natural fit. Even as a teenager in our youth group, I would lead a small group I would be involved in worship. I'd play my guitar. I'd do anything and everything that was an opportunity to minister to people. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go to a place, he would receive as an inheritance. What did he do? Think about it. Tuck it away. The Bible says he did what? He obeyed. He did it. He went, even though he didn't know where he was going. You don't need to know the destination in life. You don't need to know where God is going to take you and where you're going to end up and what that place will ultimately unfold to be. But what you do need to do is to trust the who, not the what. To trust the who, not the where. To let God, his character, his divine presence and the intimacy of that presence take you to where you need to be. It's never too late to do the first thing. Because Abraham, this is what I'm going to do. If you will trust me, I'll make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you'll be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and to your offspring I will, I will give this land. Do you notice who's speaking? Do you know what the Lord is trying to say? Where is the onus on the friendship? Who's the muscle in the mateship? The muscle is God. This is the God who says, I can, I will. You see, your faith will affect others. You need to give God, the opportunity to work in your life so that you can be a blessing to generations. You need to learn what it is to give your children over to the Lord and to the purposes of God in their lives. To release them, to bless them, to release them. Because ultimately, I've worked it out that when I get to heaven, I'm not going to have my super. 
I'm not actually going to have my address and my toys and my treasures. The only thing I'll have in heaven is spiritual legacy, spiritual influence and impact. So what are you doing with that? Because that's what will last forever. You know, the promise was to the Jewish people that you will bless every nation on earth. Is that possible? Let me tell you, the Jews comprise 0.2% of the population, but they've won 22% of the Nobel Prizes. In economics, they've won 40% of the 86 Nobel Prizes. In medicine, 56 out of 222 awards, 25% have been to Jews. Physics, 27%, 59 out of 216 awards. Chemistry, 35 out of 186, 18%. Literature, 12%. Peace, 8%. For a group that comprise 0.2 of the world's population, God's promise was that through the nation of Israel and through the faith in Yahweh that would spread to so many others, to the Christian church, you will bless the planet. And that promise has been fulfilled. Let me ask you, what is God wanting to do through your life? You may be saying, well, that's for someone else. It's too late. I'm too old. I'm too young. I want to say, stop with the excuses and let God know you. Let him be all that he wants to be in you, to know you deeply and to touch you. And if he touches you, the planet will be different. Your first encounter should never be your last encounter. 12 and 7, the Lord appeared to Abram, to your offspring I will give this land. So what does he do? He built an altar to Yahweh who had appeared to him. And from there he built an altar to Yahweh in chapter 12 and 8 and called on the name of Yahweh. 13 and 4, then Abraham called on the name of Yahweh. And in 13, 18, Abraham went to live by the great trees of Mamre and there he built an altar to Yahweh. There is a name that God says, it's, this is my name, Yahweh, Lord. I want you to know me. A lifelong, deep intimacy with an indwelling Lord. And I want you to mark the journey. Over the years, I've stopped, started with a journal. Because when the God of the universe gets my attention and says something to me, I want to write it down. Abraham wanted to mark the moment. He wanted to put a stone in the ground, an altar, to remind him every time he walked past that, yes, that was what God said to me. That's what he promised. And I can hang on to this God who is present because God has a name. His name is I Am. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of Yahweh. Yahweh. I am being always who I am. There are two big names in the Bible. One is El and the other is Yahweh. El will have, as we'll see next week, some additions to that name. But Yahweh uh, is a name that is so sacred to the Jewish people, even today they won't pronounce it. They'll pronounce another word, Adonai. And Adonai... Uh, mistakenly was added to the four letters and became Jehovah, which is a, a mistake of grammar. What we now believe is that the pronunciation was Yahweh. Because they would never say it, that made it a bit more complicated. They would sometimes use the word Elohim, Adonai, or the name, but they would never say this name. From the very top, uh, this is what it looked like in the 12th century BC in Phoenician, from right to left. Uh, Moses got hold of the Phoenician alphabet and tidied it up into the next line, uh, into pictographs, 
or pictures. Each letter is a picture. From right to left, it is this. A, a man, a hand, man, nail, man. That's what the four pictures mean. Over 4,000 years ago, God is saying, My name is Yahweh. I am. Hand, man, nail, man. You see, there's something very sacred about this name. Ezra would tidy up the script in the 5th century BC into the square current Hebrew text. But it still means what it's always meant. I am who I am. I'm always who I am. Do you need someone who's always the same, someone who's constant, who's not going to change, who's going to always love you? And then God says you need Yahweh. You need Yahweh to lead you. And where he leads, what am I going to do? I'm going to follow because that's all he asks me to do. Helen uh, Malakot uh, wrote a poem called I Am. She says, I was regretting the past and fearing the future. Suddenly my Lord was speaking and he said this, My name is I Am. He paused. I waited. He continued. When you live in the past with its mistakes and regrets, it's hard I'm not there. He continued, my name is not I was. When you live in the future with all its problems and fears, it's hard. I'm not there. My name is not I will be. But when you live in this moment, it is not hard because I'm here and my name is I am. The I am is present. He's in fact in this room. He's in fact trying to remind you of the first thing he said to you that maybe you've stopped doing. And he says, it's not too late. I want you to take the next step because I'm still waiting to take you into a place of divine intimacy. The Lord appeared to Abraham, so he built an altar to Yahweh who had become literally visible to him. The Lord became visible to Abraham. That's what it is in Hebrew. What do you think is happening in this passage? There is an unmistakable encounter with Yahweh that is so unmistakable that he knows what he's dealing with. In fact, Jesus will comment on this passage. He said, your father rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to Jesus, you're not yet 50. You're not even ready for a time. And how can you say you've seen Abraham? And Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, what? Say it with me. I am. I am. Merrill Tenney, the scholar, says, I am was recognised by the Jews as the title of deity and they took stones to throw at him. You've just crossed the line, Jesus. Not only are you inferring that you're timeless, that you knew Abraham, but more than that you knew Abraham, that you actually were the Lord that encountered Abraham. If Jesus' claim was not well-founded, then his words were openly blasphemous. He was using the language that only God could use. Do you know what's happening here? He's having a Yahweh encounter. The great I am. You know, as we look at this passage, I'm aware of one thing, that God has got some really strange friends. Abram, uh, before this chapter is closed, is going to say to his wife, uh, he's obviously married to Helen Miram or Susan Sarandon. Uh, she's a good-looking older woman. Um, and so he says to his gorgeous wife, when the Egyptians see you, they're going to say, she should be an actress. This is his uh, wife, then they will kill me, but they'll let you live. 
So here's the deal. I want you to lie for me, and I'm going to go along with the deception, and I want you just to say that you're my sister. And even if they take you into someone else's uh, uh, property and uh, uh, harem, let's agree to do this. Let me ask you, does that shock you about the quality of God's friends? Thankfully, friendship is based on God's faithful character. Not my feeble faith, not my flawed obedience. Our friendship with God is based not on my repeated flaws, but on who he is. God doesn't stop us making dreadful mistakes. Instead, he rescues our failures to develop and deepen our friendship. And if you think uh, this was just a minor lapse in his character, let me tell you, not only was he hesitant in following his friend, not only uh, did we just read about a fearful self-interest and deception, but in chapter 16 he's going to allow human reason and personal fallout to have a relationship with uh, Hagar and uh, give birth to Ishmael, and then again he's going to do the same thing after God has promised that your wife is going to bear the son. He's going to do it all over again. Just say you're my sister. God certainly can pick him. I don't know about you, but would you pick Abram for a friend? Quite frankly, would he pick you and me for a friend? Jesus said, read it with me, you are what? My friends, if you do what I command, I'm no longer calling you what? Servants, because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. I want you to know me intimately. I want you to know what it is to be a friend, not a servant. John Wesley, looking back at his conversion in later years, says it was a time when I exchanged the faith of a servant for the faith of a son. Let me ask you, are you slaving away for God? Or are you living in the mutuality of what it is for God to say, you're my friend? And I'm not hiding. I want you to know your life purpose. I want you to know the assignment, the territory that I've marked out for you. It's going to be different for every person, but there is territory, there is opportunity. And I want you to live in that space and to claim your territory. John Newton said, I'm not what I ought to be, I'm not what I want to be, I'm not what I hope to be in another world, but still I'm not what I want used to be and by the grace of God I am what I am and that God will bless in spite of my mess and the friendship with God is powerful never perfect if you're imperfect today well I want to say you like Abraham can be God's friend God is shaping you for one thing he's shaping you to know him as, a, as Yahweh who wants to lead you. He will lead if you'll follow. If you'll do the first thing. If you'll not miss the moment. If you'll go with God. You see, I think there's only three groups this morning. The unwilling, the willing, and the wanting. You see, you can be unwilling and say, no go. You can be willing but say, God, uh, you're going to have to hit me over the head with a 4B2 to get me moving. God won't do that. He's looking for friends who want him, who want to know him. And God says, I can do things. You know, as I finish, uh, when I was in Bible college, my second year, uh, I was just 19. I was... Uh, we would study from Tuesday to Friday and then from Friday night to Sunday night we'd go to a church for a, a church assignment. My assignment was in Toowoomba at Crown Street. 
So Friday afternoon, I'd hop in my E.H. Holden, go up the range, youth group, Saturday outings with young people, Sunday morning teaching a, a, a youth Bible study, preaching, uh, and then Sunday night service, and then hop in my car very late Sunday night, drive down the range, and some of you know the section from Halliden to Grantham. There wasn't the Halliden bypass back then. It was a section of road that was lined by these poplar uh, willows that had uh, culverts, that had occasional posts, some vegetable growing, but generally it was a tree-lined section. On this particular night, it was dark, it was wet, it was heavy rain. Uh, Grantham had started to issue the semi-trailers, so there was just a line of semi-trailers heading west. It was pelting rain. You could hardly see the road. As a 19-year-old, I made sure I was doing the speed limit. But just as the last truck passed me, my tyre hit the edge of the road, and suddenly my car at 100 kilometres an hour was aquaplaning sideways and slow spinning down the centre of the road. It all went very slow, as if uh, time had frozen. And I just did these large circles going down the road. And then uh, I started to get towards the edge, and then I went off the edge. I missed culverts trees, posts, ditches. There must have been one section where the road and the paddock was dead level. And then I went for about 150 metres across a paddock. And I remember eventually the car stopped and there was a big white light coming towards me. I didn't know if I was dead or what was happening, but this white light was bigger than any truck or any car. And then I realised I was looking at a train. And the train was coming straight towards me. And just as I was starting to work out what that light was, it, it turned and kept going down the train track. Because my car had ended up at the far end of a paddock, right next to a huge tree trunk called a, a restraining post. I stopped within one or two feet of this post. I hopped out of the car. I was alive. The car didn't flip, it didn't hit anything. I walked around, I was still alive. The car was still running. It was covered in a lot of vegetation. I hopped in the car, I drove through the paddock, I drove down back to Brisbane. I stopped halfway to look at what was underneath and I pulled out half of, of Grantham that was underneath. And I kept going. And I was aware that at 9 or 20, that could have been it. But God has allowed me over 44 years to do what he called me to do, which is to know him, to know his word, to love his people, to live in the territory that God had prepared for me. Let me ask you, what has God got for you? You might say, well, look, I've, I'm already, my life is already mapped out. I've already worked out my destination. I know what's going to happen for the next 30, 40 years. Let me ask you, has God signed off on that? Because he wants to take you somewhere. He wants to bring you to a place where he can work on the friendship, where he can allow you to find the place you need to be. Will you bow with me in prayer? Father, we realise that in life you sometimes empty our hands of everything so that you can fill us with the thing that really matters, and that's yourself. Lord God, Yahweh, the great I am, I want to thank you that you come to us and you want to make your home in us and for us to make our home in you. We want to thank you for the privilege of being known and for the opportunity to know you, to be intimate friends with the living, eternal God. 
And so, Father, would you in this next few weeks, would you remind us of the things that you've been saying for such a long time? Maybe we've got a bit deaf, but would you become incredibly loud? And, Lord, would you cause us to tremble in the presence of the living God and to tremble before his word? We ask in the only name that still opens up all of heaven for us, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.